breakthroughs in science go hand in hand with advancements in technology. So it seems like a no-brainer that the cell theory, the idea that all living things are composed of self-sufficient cells, resulted directly from major advancements in the field of microscopy. In this video, I'll be going through the historic timeline of the establishment of the modern cell theory. So let's jump right into it. Our story starts in the early 1600s in Middleburg, Holland, the Netherlands, with a spectacle maker named Zacharias Janssen. Credit for the first compound microscope is usually given to this Dutch spectacle maker around the year 1595, even though the claims may be disputed. This accomplishment is generally agreed upon among historians to be dated in the, 90, in the 1590s, and Janssen was very young at that time, so most historians believe that his father, who was also a spectacle maker, to have played an important role in the creation of this instrument. It didn't take much time for this microscope to become a hot item in the market, and you had every naturalist and scientist getting their hands dirty with it. So this brings us to our next scientist. Robert Hooke was an English scientist. You may know him from physics, where he discovered the law of elasticity called Hooke's law. So he was a scientist that delved in many fields of science, natural science being one of them. So what Hooke did was he studied plant tissue. In particular, he studied cork, made from the bark of a cork oak tree. So what he did was, let me just move towards the side. He cut thin slices of cork and he viewed them under his primitive light microscope. You have the light source here, which is just a heating element. So your light source is a flame and this directs the light towards the mount where your specimen is placed. And he viewed what he placed here through the eyepiece. So he cut really thin slices of cork and he viewed them under his microscope. And this is what he observed, right? Let me zoom in. Mind you, the bark of a tree is made of dead lignified tissue. So cork is technically dead tissue, it's just dead cells. And you can see that in this image here, these square, these square rectangles, right? The square rectangles represent dead cells, dead plant cells. There's no living cytoplasm in them. What he was viewing was just the cell walls of these plant cells. So as he observed the cork tissue, he saw this regular array of square or rectangular cells, right? You can also view them here. And these square or rectangular cells resembled rooms where monks lived in a monastery to hook. And in Latin, these small rooms are called cella. So Hook coined the term cellular, which in Latin means cell. So from this word, he derived the word cellular, which in Latin means cell, and that's how we get the word cell. So Hook is credited for coining the term cell. And in 1665, let me zoom out a bit. I don't know if you can view both of them at the same time. Anyhow, in 1665, Hook published his findings in a famous work, Micrographia, physiological descriptions of minute bodies made by magnifying glass. And this is a picture of what he published. This is his actual published work. And he published his findings in this where he coined the term cell and he said that when you view plant tissue under a microscope, you view these regular array of cells. And this was a big deal back then. Ten years later, another Dutch businessman and naturalist, and I'm going to butcher his name now, Anton van Leeuwenhoek, a contemporary of Hooke, crafted his very own light microscope, which was a monocular, a single lens microscope. Really proud of his invention, he went around and looked at everything and anything, from pond water to the gunk in his teeth. Yeah, he observed his dental scrapings. Leeuwenhoek was the first person in history to view living cells. He observed bacteria and protozoa. He discovered blood cells and there was the first person to see living sperm cells of animals. And he termed these microscopic organisms animalcules, which literally means little animals. The list of his discoveries is a long one. 
Leeuwenhoek is known to have made more than 500 microscopes, of which fewer than 10 have survived to this day. In basic design, probably all of Leeuwenhoek's instruments were simply powerful mic magnifying glasses, not compound microscopes of the type used today. However, his skills at grinding lenses together with his naturally acute eyesight and great care in adjusting the lighting where he worked enabled him to build microscopes that magnified over 200 times with clearer and brighter images than any of his colleagues at that time. In 1673, Lewin Hoek began writing letters to the newly formed Royal Society of London. His observations written in Dutch were translated into English or Latin and printed in the philosophical transactions of the Royal Society. Because of his immense contribution to the field of microscopy, Leeuwenhoek is rightfully called the father of microbiology. It was upon the work of Hook and Leeuwenhoek, among others, that 19th century scientists Matthias Schleiden and Theodor Schwann built their cell theory. Schleiden, a German botanist and professor of botany at the University of Jena, extensively studied plant tissue and after much observation came to the conclusion that all living plants are made up of cells. Schwann, his friend and fellow scientist, was a German physiologist who extensively studied animal tissue and made similar microscopic observations that all living animals are made up of cells. Together, Schleiden and Schwann are credited for developing the first two tenets of the cell theory, that cell is the fundamental unit of life, and all living things are composed of cells. Schleiden, however, believed in spontaneous generation. He believed that cells form through crystallization rather than cell division. It was in the 1850s that two Polish scientists living in Germany gave the third tenet of the cell theory, that cells originate from existing cells. Robert Remake, a neurologist and embryologist in 1852, published for the very first time convincing evidence that cells are derived from other cells. Three years later, Rudolf Virchow, a renowned pathologist whose microscopic studies of diseases earned him the moniker Father of Modern Pathology, published an editorial essay titled Cellular Pathology, where he popularized the concept of cell theory and in particular the maxim omnis cellular a cellular that every cell originates from existing cells. Given the similarity of Urkow's work to remakes, there is controversy as to which scientist should receive the credit for this central tenant, some saying that Urkow plagiarized remakes' work. As you can see, we have come a long way. The cell theory resulted from observations of more than 200 years, including the work of many more scientists than just the handful shown below. The modern cell theory is now considered one of the great unifying principles of biology. It establishes the cell as the basic structural and physiological unit of life, and formally establishes the principle that life is not generated spontaneously, but comes directly from pre-existing life. If you found this helpful, please consider giving this video a thumbs up and subscribe to my channel. Thank you.